the focus of tonight's lecture is the magnetic universe. Magnetic fields pervade space. All of outer space is threaded by magnetic fields. And if you thought that magnetism was maybe a rather eclectic, perhaps even irrelevant part of physics, then you'll find out in this evening's lecture that that is simply not the case. Magnetism is critically important, not just for the preservation of life on Earth, but as the explanation for some of the exotic phenomena that we see in outer space. Things behave very differently in the presence of a magnetic field, differently from what we might first expect. So let's begin with a familiar manifestation of how an everyday object can interact with a magnetic field. The compass, of course, which we now understand responds to Earth's magnetic field, was critically important for developing navigation, for being able to navigate ships to a particular new found land and back again. But magnetism should not be regarded as man-made, some kind of unusual manufactured artefact. Far from it. Magnetism is absolutely naturally occurring. <coughs> well, I don't know if she's got a spanner there stuck no, right. to a piece of magnetite. Piece of magnetite, probably. Yeah. Well, but why isn't it repelling? Oh, well, she said that uh, magnetism does exist in uh, naturally occurring. Naturally occurring. And it's not just man-made yeah. magnetism. Because yeah. in man-made magnets, you've, you've got attraction, repulsion. That's the law of magnetism, isn't it? Like poles repel, unlike poles attract. So all we have to do is go out into the natural world and find exactly the same thing. It's a law. So we should be able to see like poles... Um, repel mm. and unlike poles attract yeah but a uh, big problem is when if we were to go out into the natural world the natural environment we will not see that law actually take place mm. and another thing is also in that this compass that she's uh, highlighted to be the the main thing for navigation yeah is only attracted to magnetic field lines. Yeah, it's not. So uh, there's. It's not repelled. Absolutely. Yeah. But un, uh, we'd really like to see a demonstration of some natural, naturally occurring objects repelling each other. Uh, you can be very intelligent and very good at what you do, and you can still be stupid. Yes. Yes. yes! 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 Come on, everyone. Come on. Yes! Yeah, well, we're back again. Annoying people with our views and opinions because. Oh, because. 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 A lot of people dislike hearing other people's views and opinions. Ba -ba 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 yes, absolutely. That is so true. A lot of people do dislike hearing other people's views and opinions. Yes, I know. <clears throat> it's probably because uh, <laughs> they they want to cling hold of their own views yeah. and opinions. Yeah. They don't want their views and opinions being Challenged. Being, being made to look wrong and absolutely. incorrect yeah. and just yeah. stupid. Well, it's like that woman at Gresham College. Oh, of course, yeah, the woman at Gresham College. He who, thinks it's a magnetic universe. Yeah, the 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 art the, 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 the kinds of magnetic universe that man makes. Oh right, yeah, the that's artificial got, ones that's got attraction and repulsion. Oh, absolutely, of course, yes. That follow the magnetic law, the law of magnetism. Them, yeah, like poles repel, unlike poles attract. Thanks, yeah, well. you know all this kind of stuff. But uh, you know, I mean, so many people are living in the dream world. Mm. They literally are living in a dream world where the natural world 
and the real world just don't exist for mm. them. Yeah, I know, yeah. Because their 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 minds are elsewhere. Their yeah. minds do not respond to the real world. Don't they? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So yeah. even though these people are living in the real world, their yeah. mind is elsewhere. Their mind's elsewhere. Absolutely, of course, yeah. And that makes them have that makes them psychotic because they're they're perceiving things that simply are mm. not true. And that gives rise to things like dementia. Alzheimer's. Absolutely, of course. Absolutely, yeah. Lots of mental health problems. Lots mm. of people out there um, do happen to have mental health problems. problems lots yeah. of teachers, police officers, doctors, doctors professional people, judges. Yeah. Um, you know, you name it. Um, astronauts. Oh, right, well, yeah. Scientists. Astronauts, yeah. A lot of people like that do mm. have mental health problems. Yeah. Politicians, MPs, yeah. for example. Yeah. Anyway, come on. Let's but um, on, how are you? Surf. Yeah, sure. But how are you, Peter? Are you well? Are you well? Or are you well? I'm very well, thank you. And we both hope everyone is well too. Absolutely, of course. Yes. Now we've got uh, quite a reasonable one for everyone this evening, where we're going to have a look at the ancient Chinese drilling for natural gas and oil. Yes, yes. a lot of people out there think there's such a thing as natural gas and, and oil. oil. Natural. And Occurring these oil. these substances occur naturally and. Apparently, some people even think the ancient Chinese drilled for natural gas. Yeah. Can you believe it? I know, yeah. But just like most things, you've got to do your own research. Do your own research. Don't Ask trust. questions. Don't trust what other people tell you. And as Malcolm Agnes said, you've got to be humble. You've got to be humble. Absolutely, of course. So uh, be humble and uh, do your own research and never trust anybody. No. Go with your feelings. You're, go with your heart. Go where your heart takes you. Well, go with what you know. Go with what you know, and what yeah. you what you. And if you don't know, you don't know. No. There's lots anyway, of things I don't know, but uh, you know. Come on, let's there go. you go. So, what have we got on for everyone's displeasure for tonight, then, Peter? Well, for everyone's displeasure, we are going to have a look at. We've got a, going to uh, Nick Weech sent us a link to a, of the Aurora Borealis and the ISS. Oh, of course, yeah. So we thought we'd have a look at that video just to show people the how anomalies within it. Well, yeah, absolutely, of course. We're going to have a, we're going to revisit the talk, the Gresham College talk that we showcased at the beginning because it, she seems to think this is a magnetic universe. Absolutely, of course. A lot, along with a lot of people. Yeah. And the annoying thing is, is that she always, like lots of other people, lots of other experts, she's always uh, comparing a man-made magnet north and south pole at either end and applying that those field lines to the earth to the and to the universe as well yeah you know so we'll have a look at that um phil indy blanc gave us a, a link to some lectures quite interesting lectures yeah quite which we thought we'd share with people um we're going to cover this the ancient chinese drilling for natural gas and oil yeah and i'm not sure about uh, plutonium Possibly Stephen Hales and uh, plants absorb. Yeah, I wouldn't mind uh, just cover, having a little look at Stephen Hales. He but we the, need to do that from scratch. Who was the first guy who, who actually came up with the idea that plants absorb air? Mm. You mm. Know, so you know. So we're going to have a look at that. And Al Aran Arandas, an algae purifier. Oh, the algae purifier. purifier. Um, oh. Because they were saying about it oxygenates. Oxygenates, yeah. Oh, that was the one in the video where it, they put it, planted it in a fjord. No, in a town. Oh, that's right, yeah. In yeah, the yeah, town. Yeah. And we'll just have a little look at that and just uh, tell the viewers our take on what they're seeing. Yep, so, so let's get on. So we've got an awful lot to uh, get on. And we've got an awful lot to dispel, haven't we, really? Oh, yeah. that? Dispel these myths. We're absolutely, there's so much rubbish in man's society, lies, bullshit, myths, or whatever you want to call, call them, it, yeah. that it's nice to come along and actually dispel a lot of this rubbish yeah. to be rubbish. Well, I think we should start off with the Aurora Borealis, and let's go up high in 450 miles above the Earth's surface. Okay, there we go. Yes, now, uh, who was it, Phil? Well, was it Phil? Nick Weech. Oh, Nick Weech gave us a link to this video. We're going to have to uh, cut off the... This was uploaded by... Um, Anomaly Detected. Anomaly Detected. 
Well, you're not on the ISS. Yeah, one thing I would, oh, surface. yeah, yeah, you know, an anomaly. You, you begin to realize, oh, let's go back to, this is supposed to be like uh, videography from the International Space Station. You know, that thing that's manned and it's orbiting the Earth, you know, up there. We know something's up there, but we just don't think it's manned at all. Absolutely, but uh, allegedly this and is it's not man-made either. What's not man-made? What's whatever's up there? How do you know? Oh yeah, it's not man-made. Yeah, it yeah. can't be man-made. But there is an object floating around the place. That's for sure. Floating, as in you know, I'll use the word loosely. Mm. But uh, his mm. his man's videography of uh, the uh, the Northern Lights taken yeah. from the International Space Station, four K. I mean, look. Well, when you, look at one, I mean, one thing I've got to mention that is. Um, one thing you've got to, uh, I've got to mention about this footage, and, and that is the curvature. Um, the actual radius of the Earth seems to be small, then it seems to be big. Well, there is, there's quite a large. There's a, there's, I mean, there's a large wide curve, wide curve there. Um, so it gives the impression the International Space Station is quite close. And now there's more of a curve, which means the uh, International Space Station is further away. Oh uh, yeah, I know what you mean. Do, yeah. do you know what I mean? It seems yeah. to it seems to be different in height a lot of the time, whereas it, essentially it should be the same. Yeah. You know? But there's you see the thing is with all of this video footage, there's no reason why any of this cannot be faked, mm-hmm. generated yeah, but in a film studio because the the, the information that we covered is because. Well, looking at that, you'll find that whenever you're looking at lights from above, they're always flickering. City lights, they're always flickering. Okay. And yet they're, they're not. None of them are, none of those lights are flickering. Yeah, they're kind of, uh, you'd actually yeah. see them flicker. But anyway. Anyway. One thing to remember, and that is when we looked at the, that, uh, article from the Greenwich, uh, oh, oh, that Greenwich, yeah, journal about oh, the Aurora Borealis. Aurora Borealis. They mentioned that the Aurora Borealis starts at a certain height, altitude, altitude, 80 miles, and goes up to, or was it 80 miles tops? No, it starts and then goes up to, it goes, goes up to a thousand miles or, or yeah, something. something. Yeah, it goes up quite a lot. But the International Space Station is only meant to be so high up. Yeah. So you wouldn't, it would actually go through the Aurora Borealis. Sure. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I mean, the main thing about all of this video footage is that you know, there's there's no proof that it's actually genuine. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, you know, I'm just watching. I wouldn't say that's genuine. You, so, I, where's my popcorn? Oh, you know, yeah. could be eating popcorn now. Oh, we're just waiting for the for the uh, young uh, young lady to come come. Yeah, yeah, we're waiting for Han come. Solo on the Millennium Falcon to oh, right, yeah. just fly past, do a run by, you know, with Chewie Chewbacca, you know. Yeah. You know, but you know that it's not going to happen, is it? You know, but you can expect it to happen here because all this is just rubbish. Mm. It's just made from yeah, anyway, made well, from the imagination, made for TV, it's made for television, of course. Yeah, yeah. I think there was one when um, there was one. Yeah, all those lights would be flickering. Yeah, if you look at this in the cupola, look, and you can see the whole full circle yeah, they, of the of yeah, the globe there. All right, but they and would think, argue that the that's because of the distortion of the, the windows. But then is it though? No, it can't be. No, it can't, it can't be. be. You can see the full circle of the Earth there, which implies the International Space Station is really far away. Mm. And yet on the next shot, you can you see this. Oh, it's close so up. It's very close. Mm. And I always thought the International Space Station orbits the Earth at the same height. It doesn't go like this, you know. Mm. So, you know, go far, you know, doesn't do that. It goes at the same elevation, I'm sure. Mm. Could be wrong, but I mean... Pfft. That's why none of it makes sense. None of this makes actual sense. That's because it's rubbish. It's all bullshit, as far as I, in my opinion. It's absolutely yeah, rubbish. Well, look, there's an, oh, this is a good one about the moon. You'll love the moon. This oh, is, well, this yeah, is a good, good one. We've got yeah. to do this, because this is... If you watch the moon on this one, it looks CGI, doesn't it? Yeah. really does. It looks... Planted on the... Absolutely. It's a layer. It looks terrible, you know. There, there you go. There you go. go. That's just a layer. You can absolutely. tell that's a layer. That's a layer, yeah. Because the absolutely yeah, because the moon should be rotating. No, because whenever you get uh, high altitude footage of uh, weather uh, cameras on fixed to weather balloons, yeah. you never actually see the moon like that. Yeah, you never do. Yeah, you never do. 
Yeah, I know, yeah. And yet all of a sudden, the, uh, they, they get it, you know. They get it like yeah. that, you know. Never seen the moon like that from high altitude weather balloon footage. Oh, right, yeah. I mean, Never. it's just ridiculous, really. Yeah. I mean, there you go, look. It's rubbish. You know, you know it's just... Rubbish. It doesn't look right, does it? No. It doesn't look right. right. Absolutely, of anyway, course. Yeah. Anyway, so thanks, uh, Nick, for that. Yeah, thanks, blink. Nick, for that, yeah. Anomaly detected, yeah. Quite a few yeah, anomalies yeah, yeah. there, but... Yeah. Uh, you know, none of it can be proved to be true. None of it, it can be proved to be true. It's all fantasy. All of yep. it's fantasy, in my opinion. Yeah. Anyway, oh, we might as well get up those hack up because they're on the uh, they're on there. Oh, there. Yeah. Which one first? We might as well get up the absolute knowledge. Oh, absolute knowledge. Now these are. Um, Which is no, you've got this. Yeah, you've, got oh, you've there. got it here. Yeah, you've got it here, haven't you? Now these are. Um, let's go on lecture one. That would be the best one to to go on. Um, oh, now, is, yeah. Did I mention Phil Indiblon gave us these? Yeah, yeah, things. Phil. Yeah, Phil. Thanks, Phil, for this one. Phil Indiblon gave us uh, a link to this one. Uh, this is HPS one uh, hundred lecture zero one introduction. Hakob Barsegian. Uh, Barsegian. Absolutely. Would anyone study history and philosophy of science? What are some of the key questions addressed by history of philosophy and science? Mm -hmm. Now. I have to admit, this series of videos are very good if you would like to um, understand more about science. And how it's developed over the centuries. How it's developed over the centuries, and but also gaining a philosophical understanding of science. Now, admittedly, Hakub um, works for a university, therefore he will not say um, anything that will uh, jeopardise his job. He'll always toe the party line. He'll toe the party line, but he does put forward a, uh, a number of views that do seem to be quite um, plausible mm. with regard to the philosophy of science and as well as um, in the history of science. Uh, so, But the introduction is quite good. I don't think we need to actually uh, go into what he talks about. But the thing is, is that when you think about... Um, um, like science from early early times we're looking at ancient Greek times we're looking at Aristotelian kind of understanding of the natural world and then during Newton's time yeah. it changes the, the understanding science changes to accommodate Newton's understandings of the natural world and then we have uh, Einstein general relativity and so we've got three different paradigms going on and yet, the thing yeah, for is, example, all understanding how an object falls, like the apple on the tree, an apple on tr the apple on the tree falls to the ground, and you can understand it in an Aristotelian uh, way. Way you can understand it in a Newtonian way, or you could understand it in an Einstein way. But the thing is, is that although throughout all of the history of uh, these guys, you know, Aristotle was ancient Greece, two thousand five hundred years ago, maybe. Then you had Newton in the 16th, 16th, 17th century, I believe. Then now you've got current thought with uh, Einstein. The the actual um, the actual uh, phenomena, the falling of the apple from the tree, hasn't changed at all. That observation hasn't changed at all. The only thing that has changed is the perception of it, the understanding of why the apple falls. That's the only thing that's changed throughout all of history, isn't it? And that only exists in, in our minds. And that only exists in people's minds, yeah? So so you could put forward the view that Aristotle could be right, Newton could be right, absolutely, and Einstein could, could be, be right. right. But the thing is, is that nobody has disproved, even today, Aristotle from being wrong. wrong. Yeah. For some reason, we've had scientific change where Aristotle... His ideas were just discarded mm. and uh, taken on board with, uh, with Newton's. Newton's ideas were taken on board. And now we, we're getting to a point where Newton's ideas are being thrown to one side. We're taken on board um, Einstein's. But in all of the cases, none have been discarded, disproved. Mm. You know, I mean, but you and I could disprove Newton's um, in that there's no... We could disprove the understanding of an external force acting on the apple. 
Uh, well, you yeah, could you you could you through, could do yeah. that. But with Aristotle, you can't disprove. No one's disproved Aristotle at all. No, you know. So his uh, his understanding could well be correct. Yeah, because Aristotle put the Earth at at the center of the universe, and that was the reason why objects fell towards it. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, he he goes into um, he goes into uh, some good. Uh, areas within science like for example absolute knowledge so he looks at uh, absolute knowledge from a philosophical point of view okay is there such a thing is there such a thing you know if you've got science and you're trying to understand the natural world well surely there's got to be some absolute knowledge some absolute truths regarding the natural world but um you know as he goes through his lectures he he real he tells the viewer that uh, only the for- only in the formal sciences is there absolute knowledge because mm. all of the mathematics and yeah, and logic logic um, yeah um because all of the um all of the quantities that are used are defined very well indeed and cannot be questioned whereas when we go into physics and when we go into um chemistry when we go into biology a lot of the the uh, parameters are not de- are ill defined, so we don't really know what we're talking about. So we cannot arrive really at any formal, um, absolute knowledge, knowledge no. regarding the world we live in. Yeah. And okay. yet, given that, oh, you got all these people walking the earth who think that what they know about the natural world, being it's a globe, water's H two O. The air we breathe is made up of constituents of oxygen, nitrogen, etc. That fish uh, breathe in dissolved oxygen in the water. That you know, um, you've got radioactive carbon fourteen in the atmosphere occurring There's magnetic naturally. Poles. There's magnetic poles. You know, you've got all of the solar system. All this, they think all of this is absolutely true. Mm. That's a big problem. These people are messed up. To think that way. Yeah, okay. There we go. There we go. But I would uh, actually recommend uh, anybody watch these, uh, uh, the whole lot, because uh, it, it just gives an insight into... Uh, uh, the history of science. History of science, philosophy yeah. of science, yeah. and even having a, a general understanding on why science changes the, its some, its methods. Because I'm sure that now nowadays, science would even accept observation and yet, yeah, we'll get yeah, absolutely, yeah, that works, yeah. Just to mm. observe something, yeah, that's scientific. Yeah, well, especially if you know. you're into astronomy. In other words, it doesn't, scientific investigation doesn't have to follow the scientific method. method. No. It doesn't have to do that. It also talks about pseudoscience as well, doesn't it? Absolutely, it talks about pseudoscience as compared to, you know, science. Yeah, anyway, come on. But, uh, yeah, very good, you know. So, uh, thanks, Phil, for that one. That's very kind of you. But, uh, yeah, go, go and have a little watch of those ones. They're pretty good. Then let's go on to the Gresham College talk again. Oh, yes, of course, yes. Now, we've got universe. Here yeah, we go. Now, what we're going to do here, This I don't what, know who the, who's the woman, by the way. Do we know who? Oh, electrical Catherine, Catherine Blundell. Blundell. Oh, she got an OBE. Yeah. Can you believe it? That's why she's always smiling. You Can you believe it? This an woman. OBE. Yeah, this woman here. This woman here, right there. Right there, where is she? Uh, yeah, I don't want to. I want to get a picture of a, a big. There yeah. she is. She, this woman here, has got an OBE. Yeah. Can you believe it? And yet, when we go through the video, you begin to realise she's spouting out fantasy stuff. She might as well be a science fiction writer. Yeah. And yet, she's got an OBE. Yeah. yeah. You know, it re- when you think about it logically, there's no room in this society for people who are very realistic. Not really. In, in in order for you to get on in life in this society, you got to be filled with rubbish, dreams, Dream. fantasy. Yeah. You got to, you got to live by your imagination. Mm. You know. Yeah. But it's quite true, though, isn't it? Yeah, basically. Yeah. You know, it, it's all wrong, but you mm. know. Hey ho, hey ho! You know, that's because a lot of the people up top are in their imaginations. A lot of people up top, yeah, dislike the real, real world. world. Yeah. They dislike. Yeah. Yeah, they just like the real world. They yeah. want to live in a dream, dream world. Yeah. Uh, but uh, there you go. Anyway, uh, we got up to uh, the... Uh, oh, we got up to... Yeah, we've uh, done this bit. 
we, we got up to the spanner, didn't we? Yeah, we've done this bit. We've done that bit. And then, yeah, then she actually talks about the, um, the iron filings, right, the yeah. bar magnet. I classic, um, classic, um, you know, I'll just play some they of all it. They all do it. A little bit to get the iron filings to respond to their magnetic environment. Now, this is a man-made object. Man-made. You won't find this naturally nature. occurring at all. But that, but you can see there's a north-south divide. You know, there's a north-south um, magnetism attraction and yeah, anyway, I don't think you should play all of it because it's uh, probably copied. Of, co- of course, yeah. So we've got. So here she goes into the the mag- laws of magnetism. Mm, yeah. Okay. So it's basic stuff. It's all basic stuff. That this is the man-made. And now, an electron in a magnetic field moving from the. Should we play some of this? Because yeah. this is. Uh, Quite, quite, well, well, it's just nuts, but here we go, let's have a listen. Can you parallel to the local direction of the magnetic field lines? Well, it just moves across, left to right. If and only if it is parallel to the local direction of the mag- magnetic field lines. An electron moving parallel to magnetic field lines will continue to move parallel. It won't respond at all to the presence of the magnetic field, assuming they're exactly parallel. However, it's a little bit different if the electron is moving at a different angle with respect to the magnetic field lines. Let's imagine that the electron is moving exactly perpendicular to the magnetic field lines when it appears in the middle of our experiment. If that happens, the electron will just trace circles around the magnetic field line, just going round and round and round. Now, if you have some intermediate angle between perfectly parallel and perpendicular, which gives you the circular motion and the straight parallel motion, irrespectively, then you trace out a helical path much like the grey line is illustrated here. You will get that every single time, that helical path for an electron. Yeah, but that's just conceptual. That, well, I, well, yeah, because you can't see. And also that's based on, a, on, on an oscilloscope. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, an electron has never been proved to exist. That's number one. Um, number two, this is really essentially just theory, theoretical. Isn't it amazing how you've got a, you've got a helical path for your electron moving uh, in a magnetic field, but you've also got uh, a, a, a copy of that would be the genes, your DNA, helical path. You know, mm. it's surprising how they've people have borrowed. Oh well, that, oh, that sounds really good, and they've added it into their own understanding. You know. Mm. I mean, because even DNA, there's no proof that DNA actually exists. But if we continue on through here, I think this is the best part. Oh, isn't well, it? Right, here we go. So yeah. let's, let's carry we go. on. Yeah, we've got to listen to this. Here we go. It will be undergoing acceleration. And it turns out, because of quantum mechanics, that you can't have that kind of acceleration without simultaneously emitting a photon in a way that the direction of the photon also knows exactly about the direction of the electron and of the magnetic field lines. This works out in a very detailed way. It's important to realise that what I've just said has been very well established over the past um, well over a century now, thanks to the work of the Scottish physicist James Clerk Maxwell. He demonstrated that light is comprised of a wave in electric field and a wave in magnetic field. That is what comprises a photon. It right. Right, I'm still uh-huh. still kind of like uh, well, we we all remember that James Clerk Maxwell didn't demonstrate anything, anything. other than writing algebra and equations on a piece of paper. It was he he had a very close relationship with um, Michael Faraday. Michael Faraday had the idea 
because of his recent work on electromagnetism, he came up with the idea that light is electromagnetic. And basically, James Clerk Maxwell, who was a good friend of Michael Faraday's, he got conjured up some of these equations, um, equations and said, hey, you're right, uh, Michael. You're absolutely right. The light travels at the speed of light. Mm. And the speed yeah. of light is this. Light has got to be electromagnetic. Magnetic. Yeah. 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 And yet, there's n- when you look at a candle, how is that electromagnetic? When you look at the, the light from a candle. But yeah, when you look at the light from a candle, okay, how is that magnetic, electromagnetic? How can you detect the electromagnetic light being emitted from a candle? Sorry. Anybody got any ideas? Sorry, you can't. You know, it's absolutely rubbish. I mean, when you think about it logically, there's Michael Faraday. Now he's bound to think in terms, he's the first guy to ever come up with magnetism um, and electricity cutting through a magnetic field produces motion or wire cutting or through, wire cutting through a, a magnetic, magnetic field, field with a current running through it will produce motion he's the first ever person to actually come up with, with a motor the electric yeah. motor and the electric generator mm. okay he's the first person so he's bound to think start thinking in b- uh, ways of electromagnetism mm. electricity and magnetism <clears throat> and he was probably in, in such a uh, he had such a head start on lots of other people that he was then able to create lots of concepts absolutely of course that could actually uh, take over the whole could that could create a whole new area within physics, physics yeah a whole new area absolutely but, of course. people were looking up to michael faraday and his buddy, James Clark Maxwell, because everyone thought they had the answers. Because yeah. they were streets ahead of everyone else. Absolutely, of course. But that, that, they didn't really have all the answers. All they did was just discovered um, the, the, electri- the, the effects of combining electricity and magnetism. Mm. That's all they did. Mm. Really, of course. I mean, yeah. I don't know whether we need to... We um, need to spend a lot, because she talks about the Aurora Borealis. I mean, See, now she, she doesn't talk about... Um, in the, I'm sure she, this one, she doesn't talk about... Um, see, in our last video, they were saying that it's the sun's uh, activity that uh, it affects the gases, the gases in, in the, the atmosphere. atmosphere. But I'm sure here... Yeah, it charge, but depends very much on the nature of the charged charge particles... particles. Yeah, that suddenly rock up on Earth. Uh, she's magnetic saying field. that it's affecting the Earth's magnetic field. Yeah, not the gases. Oh, right, yeah. Maybe we should uh, just go back and see. She's got just, a, just she's just got a slightly different explanation why the aurora borealis. Sure. I was just going to play this, and uh, yeah, I don't want to play too much of it. Yeah, uh, there we go. So Earth's magnetic field. There you go. But the point is, is that you've got Michael Faraday years, many years ago fucking about with electricity and magnetism okay uh, generates creates a motor electric motor creates a a, a, um, a generator as well okay but then they've got this understanding of electricity and magnetism electromagnetism now what's happening is that they are people um, are applying that understanding to the natural world to the universe yeah. out there Hence, we get Earth's magnetic field in relation to the aurora. And here is such an example. Should we, can we play? Go on, then. I think we, there's no harm. And here's such an example, the aurora. An example of the aurora, which we see if you go to northern latitudes, in which case they're often called the northern lights, or if you go closer to the south pole, in which case they're called the southern lights, of course you see absolutely remarkable and beautiful structures if it's dark enough so that light from the sun doesn't swamp out these beautiful structures. Whether it's green or whether it's pink depends very much on the nature of the charged particles that suddenly rock up on Earth's magnetic field, whether you've got helium or whether you've got oxygen or whether you've got something a little bit more unusual. That determines the colour, 
But the distribution, the shapes that you see in space, depend on the clouds of charged particles that rock up and the magnetic field structure of planet Earth itself. Yeah, I mean, no, no, no. I'll, I'll, you know, how can you say that? Well, I mean, it's because of the, the oxygen, yeah, or the nitrogen in the atmosphere, yeah, which, which determines the colour. Because if you had more, if you think that there's if you think there's oxygen, nitrogen covering the whole of the planet Earth, that's I'm just assuming that the Earth's a globe now. No. So why is it you see you don't see the aurora? in lots of other places. Yeah, but they're, they're going on the assumption there's a magnetosphere. Yeah, I know that. But sure. they're talking about charged particles are interacting with the gases up. Yeah, I know, yeah, sure. But we, how do they know that the gases aren't covering the whole of the Earth? Oh, I know, yeah, sure. So why is the charged oh. particles not... A f why don't we see nor the lights in the equator? Well, yeah, but I'm sure I, I understand what you're saying. But that what that the story, their story, their fantasy story is that you got this magnetosphere and the sun's rays can go into the into the poles. Right. The charged particles mm. can go into the poles because it's weaker there, and because um, the magnetosphere deflects a lot of sun's charged particles away right, from okay. the Earth. And then these charged particles can go into the north and south and uh, uh, interact with the gases in the atmosphere, like oxygen, nitrogen, to create the colours that you see. Wow, it's amazing, isn't but it? But the only reason why they say that uh, oxygen and nitrogen is because they think oxygen and nitrogen are constituents of the air. Oh, right, well, yeah. But even though that as you go higher up, the air gets thinner. Thinner and thinner. There's very little... Oxygen and nitrogen, nitrogen not there. Or, then, sorry, there would be very little, if not any, oxygen, oxygen and nitrogen, nitrogen up there. And we've also got considered the atomic weights of oxygen and nitrogen. And they're uh, denser than sure. air. But we've also got to consider the fact there's no proof there is a magnetosphere. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. We've also got to... Um, we've also we've got, got to, to uh, acknowledge, acknowledge the view that there isn't. the Earth is not a spinning ball. With an iron core. And we've also got to put forward the view that the um, the aurora are not magnetic in nature at all. At all, yeah. They're not even electromagnetic. Where is the proof? There's no proof. It's all of what she's saying here about the aurora and probably all about the rest of her, is her, her um, talk. Her talk is all fantasy. It's all based on Faraday and Maxwell. It's all based... Now she talks about planet Mars. There's no magnetic PPE. Wow. You know, I mean, I mean, it's great what she's going into, but all it's all it's come up, all it's come from, there's, so, the, oh, there there's the magnetosphere. Yeah. You know, all it's come from is just Michael Faraday fucking about with magnetism and electricity. electricity. Yeah. That, that, that's it. That's all he had to do was fuck about with those two things. And lo and behold, you've got this whole understanding of the natural world unfolding before our very eyes, eyes. where yeah. people seem to think they have all of the answers yeah. to the universe. Yeah, I know, yeah. And yet it's all bollocks. It and, totally and is bullshit. And they even think that there's a bar magnet in the middle of the earth. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they think there's a bar magnet in the... In, in the, the middle, in the middle of the earth. earth, I mean, it's just ridiculous. Crazy. These people have got mental health, health problems. problems. Yeah, yeah, big mental health problems. Yeah, you know, it's um, it's a shame I I wasn't at school now because I'd be saying, "How do you know any of this is true?" true. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, we How don't. How can you have well, that bar magnet? Space. How can you have that bar magnet in the earth or the the magnetosphere fields hmm. that mimic a bar magnet when there's a core of the earth? Allegedly. Allegedly. Yeah. I can't, you know, I can't work that the, one out. The spherical. Well, when do you... And a spherical, from what we've done, the spherical magnet, ball, a ball magnet doesn't have the same field lines as this. As this, absolutely, of course. It doesn't. Does it, uh, does a ball, I can't remember, but does a ball magnet just attract? I can't, I can't remember exactly, but we, we move some iron filings over the surface of the, the, Ball magnet. The ball magnet. 
and from what I remember, it does only attract. It only attracts at certain points. Oh yeah, within yeah, sure. the yeah within the, on the ball surface. Yeah, it, it, it only attracts. It doesn't repel. It doesn't repel as such, does it? No, sure. Because yeah, but you you don't get this. I mean, it's it's all it's all bullshit. You know, magnetic universe. But, you know, yeah, yeah. The electric universe. I mean, it's just, it's just stuff for the imagination, as far as I'm concerned. Mm. You know, because there's no proof that any of this is true. True. There there we go. Go. Not some of them. Clear off. I mean, that's what, you know, and she gets she gets an OBE yeah. just for telling stories. Talking rubbish. Just for telling stories. Or oh, sorry, for talking or providing information that cannot be verified. That cannot be proved to be true. true. None of it can be yeah. proved to be true. You know, it's, it's what world we live in. What society we live in. Where all you've got to do is talk out rubbish and you get praised for it. Whereas, you know, people who speak truth they don't even get a look in, do they? You know, it's mad, isn't it? Mad. Yeah. Anyway, come on, people in it are mad. Well, look at that DNA, mammoths, Neanderthals, and your, you know, Where's Harvard that one? University. Where's that one? That one there. Oh, that one. DNA, mammoths, Neanderthals, and, and your, your imagination. Ancestors. And your ancestors, you know. I mean, you know, let's just quickly look on this one. Look. Yeah, DNA, mammoths, Neanderthals, and your ancestors. You know what I mean? Come on. It's mad. Absolutely mad. Mad. Madness. And that's oh, at a yeah. university. Yeah. Well, look at that. David Montgomery, Noah's Flood and the Development of... Oh, here we go. That is another one, that. David Montgomery. Development of Geology. Noah's Flood yeah. and the Development of Geology. Wow. Well. N- another one by Harvard University. How is it possible that we we have education establishments giving out this rubbish, this yeah. fiction? Yeah, I know. Yeah, you know, it's all fiction, fiction, and yet it's okay for them to pump, pump it out, pump it out. Yeah. You know, it's just anyway, it's mad, madness. Go on, then. Anyway, are we going to have a look at that algae algae printer? Uh, Purify. We should do. I don't know where the um, the video is. Oh, oh. Well, we need a. Uh, we need a. Uh, wait there. How algae? Was it um, algae purifier? Oh, wait there. That's what you've written. There you go. Algae purifier, purifier. We might get the video that we watch. We did watch a very good video. There it is. Oh, there we go. There we go. We've got we got this one. Now we did watch this video, and it's quite good. It was given to us by. Um, Al Arandus. Uh, so thanks for that one. And uh, it's algae, the super plant of the future. Apparently mm. you can do quite a lot of stuff with algae. Yeah, can even make food packaging with it as well. Absolutely, of course. Now there's one section in here. Um, oh, I think uh, well, we've got to we've got to look at two bits. One's the bit where she's got the plants and the bubbles on it. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and the other one, we've just got to find it. Uh, oh, that's right. Cause oh, make, here it is. They make a, a very dense material from should we, it. As well. should, we, should we play this here? Because I think that there it is. There they. Oh think. right, yeah, yeah. So we'll just play this this section here. Okay. So are you listening? I've just got to. Yeah, that's fine. For now, a French company wants to make use of algae's appetite for CO2 in another way. In Poissy, on the outskirts of Paris they've installed an experimental purifier. They hope it will capture one ton of CO2 per year, as much as a boulevard of trees. La performance en termes de captation de CO2 et production d'oxygène va dépendre de la... The amount of CO2 in the air affects how much will be absorbed, and therefore how much oxygen is produced. Sur une colonne comme celle-ci, dans un environnement urbain, a purifier like this one, placed in an urban area, produces as much oxygen as several dozen trees. In industrial settings, with higher carbon emissions, it's equivalent to more than a hundred trees. Inside this purifier, 1,000 liters of water hold 10 kilos of microalgae. The purifier sucks up the surrounding air, then circulates it internally. LEDs provide light. Future iterations will use much more natural light, and LEDs only at night. 
We aim to run the system 24-7, 365 days a year. Although this purifier is just a test version, measurements already show an improvement in air quality. Yeah. Fresh air. Oh, there you go. Yeah, I mean, we our our view on our view on this little uh, beast of a uh, 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 apparatus is simply that it's just an air purifier. Yeah. In that they're bubbling the air through the algae. Mm. And then the air comes out a little, a little bit cleaner because yeah. the algae's taken out the particulates in the air and yeah, all the shit. But it's know. no different if you bubbled air through water. It's no different than if you bubbled air through water. water. You know, we think it would be the same. Because the air, same kind of stuff. Because air, if you push past air through water, water will capture some of the particulates. So Absolutely you get cool. clean air coming out. Yeah, but what you might not do is uh, you might not have to change the water. And you've got to remember also... No, Oh, but you've got to remember that the CO2 is meant to dissolve in water as well. Oh, CO2 is supposed so to dissolve in water. It would water. do exactly the same. Yeah, I mean, all they'd have to do is just, like you say, is change the water every now and again. Sure. But uh, notice, the, notice the nice little diagrams for the kids. For the kids to look at. To oh, look at. oh, oh Mom, what's amazing? this over here? Yeah, I've got a look at this. Doing oh, look, the oh they're, they're taking all of the CO2 out of the air. It saves us planting five trees. Absolutely. But when you think about it, it's just an air purifier. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's a glorified air purifier. Oh. Nothing more, nothing less. Yeah. But street furniture. They don't show you the oxygen that it's div dishing out, does it? No. It's because all it's dishing out is it's yeah. just clean air. clean air. But the thing is, they think it's giving out oxygen because there's they think there's oxygen in the air as a constituent. Well, not only that. So there's oxygen going in along with CO2 and other things, and but there's oxygen coming out. But not only that, they think it's photosynthesis because the algae is absorbing the CO2 to then release oh, sure. oxygen. But that will only happen if they put in some baking soda oh, right. into, then, in with the algae. And did you see them putting any baking soda in? No, in I, no, I didn't. No, I didn't see that at all. Well, you're not going to get any oxygen then, absolutely, are you? Absolutely, of course. But it's amazing what people... Uh, it's amazing what people are led to think and then walk around for the rest of their life thinking that what they've been led to think is true yeah, know, when yeah. it's really yeah. untrue. But can you imagine if you had one of these in every town, town centre, or a few of these in every town centre, you'd have loads of people thinking that it's dishing out oxygen. Absolutely, of course. <laughs> that there, there is oxygen as you, a constituent. You'd even have people standing nearby. Oh, with a getting a, a tube, <laughs> yeah, congregating nearby because they think that they the want to get hit cleaner. Oh, you'll have uh, more oxygen. You'll have, you'll have Santos Spinacci, <laughs> oh, well, yeah, with nasal cannula. cannula. Yeah. They'll be plugging it, plugging it into these, to the, into these things. Machines, yeah. yeah. Well, got to have a of oxygen, man. Well, why don't they do that? I mean, they could no, no, they could do that. You know, I mean, you can have bars. You yeah. can have bars. You can have oxygen o bars. Oxygen hit bars. You know, you can sit yeah. there and just plug your nasal cannula in, and you're there. Well, man, that's really cool. It's, it's just rubbish. Yeah, no, it's just it? mad. But uh, there was a, one more bit. I think it was here, wasn't it? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, there, yeah. And it was here. Now, we go back to, uh, I think, after this, this woman in Faroe Islands. Yeah, we go back to this woman who's in the Faroe Islands. Right there. This this woman here is back in the Faroe Islands. Agnes Moltz Mortensen. Who has a company growing algae mm. for sale of food, as a food. Hmm. Okay. Yummy. So here she is. She's opened up her, uh, her lorry container. Place of work. Her place of work. She's uh, putting on all of her thingies. Now, you, th you'll like this because here's the algae that she's kind of um, well, growing. Sorry, growing or so that before it goes out into the rivers and streams or into the sea. But uh, I think we should play this. Um, right. Now. So she's picking out a few bits right there. Is it, is it here that she talks about? This, this, this is good. You'll like this. You know, right there. Notice she's got the lights there. Okay, she's got strong lights. And so um, heat. Right there. Oxygen. There. there okay, let's just, let's just play it for... Um, let's just great. play it for I didn't know I spoke uh, Norwegian. So have a little listen to this. This is great. This is good. Carefully. 
she checks the spore's growth every couple of days. The plan is to deploy these uh, on our farm on Kalbaksfjörður in uh, October. And um, so I'm just, you know, maintaining, just keeping them alive and healthy until then. Because of the photosynthesis, you know, there's a lot of oxygen production in here when the light is shining on them. So you can see bubbles on, on the seaweed ropes. The algae grow on small ropes. Later. Yeah, I mean, when, now she's, she's, she's a scientist, allegedly. Yeah. Uh, she's been to it, had an education, and she obviously has been taught photosynthesis. Plants absorb uh, CO2. Sodium bicarbonate. Sodium bicarbonate and release oxygen. Okay. Now, she, now, because she's gone through that education system, okay, or that indoctrination system, she looks at the bubbles on these, uh, on these cylindrical towers of algae and she sees the bubbles there and she automatically thinks oxygen. Automatically. And yet, the thing is, is that how does she know they're oxygen? Well, you, you need to test. test. You, you need, need to test. test. They are oxygen. Now, as far as I'm concerned, she doesn't carry out any tests. Um, they are oxygen. But the thing is, one of the things that annoys me about this is that when you look at... Uh, no, the annoying, the bit? no, the annoying thing is, is that she, w when, she, go back. when she created those towers, yeah, yeah. because she's got rope, she's wrapped rope around these cylindrical mesh things, yeah, yeah. and the algae st stuck to the rope. Sure, and okay. It's growing yeah. on the rope. But the thing is, is that air is trapped in that oh. rope. Yeah. And then we know because of the light, the light is producing heat. Those spotlights are very warm. Those spotlights are very and hot. And if you've got yeah. a very, very small warm. little pocket of air in any part of that, it'll expand. It'll expand, absolutely. Because course. gases expand when it's subjected to heat. Oh, but the thing is, is that she's got motion in those. She's got bubblers. So? No, that? no, but it's moving the, it's moving the water. That's all yeah, I'm saying. I'm just bubbles. Yeah, but I'm just talking about the bubbles that are forming here. The yeah, bubbles yeah. are forming there because of the small little air air pockets that pocket. have been trapped. Yeah, prior because, to installation. Yeah, because, during installation. Yeah, because it's Sorry. quite it's quite possible she actually takes them out of the water. Yeah. To look at them, to visibly check them, and then drop them back in yeah, the water. Yeah. As soon as you drop them back in in the water, you go. Those algae are going to. Um, or the rope, or or the rope, or a lot of things going to attract air, yeah, yeah, and you'll you'll end up with air bubbles everywhere. So it's likely, in our view, it's likely when we see the bubbles um, here, yeah. for example, they're not oxygen at all. Yeah, and you can one they're can, just air. Yeah, and one can quite easily determine that the, that it is air simply because when she first started, I bet there were no air bubbles there. Absolutely, yeah, sure. Put the heat on, yeah. left it for but you a can't few see, days or you whatever. Can, the air bubble started to pit, started, started to appear, and they got bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay. Absolutely. Well, there's no air bubbles in this view. Wait a minute, there. You can't. I don't know. Or are they yeah, there? Yeah. Oh, they're there. They're all air bubbles. Oh, they're all air bubbles. Yeah. Yeah. There's bubbles on the top, though, isn't there? I didn't think there were there, but now, yeah, sure, I can see them. You can see the bubbles float. F the froth on the top. As well. That could be coming from the bubbler. Yeah, I know, yeah. I'm just talking about the oh. air bubbles on the algae. Sure. On those there you go, there. yeah. Sure. There's no way there's oxygen, though. No. They're, they're definitely not oxygen at all. You know, she'd like them to be oxygen, mm. you know, but where's where's the source of oxygen come from? Yeah. Anyway. Anyway, but uh, that's that one. That's that. Uh, yeah, we've done all that. Yeah, absolutely, of course. Worst thing is, is that you it's, don't, no, it's no different. To you what? don't see them on there. Well, where are the oxygen yeah. there? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you, know, yeah. you know, I mean, it's just crazy. These these are in the natural habitat, yeah. not in some artificial environment, box container. Yeah. But this is the uh, their um, natural habitat, and there's no. Uh, it, she's in a natural habitat, and yet, how do we know she's breathing oxygen? She's breathing air. Yeah, that's yeah. all she's doing. You know, I mean, you know, it's just ridiculous. Yeah, I know, yeah. It's, it's ridiculous, ridiculous. What, what some people think. But anyway. Yes, yes it's, it's no different with those charts. 
you know, getting the child. Absolutely. Put yeah. them in a syringe to suck all the air, air out. out. But, uh, yeah, you've got to think whether you're sucking all of the air out. Yeah, I know. It could yeah. be trapped yeah. air yeah. in there. Absolutely. You just can't yeah. get out, you know. It's just madness what people it ties are. in with um, Stephen Hales. Stephen Hales, yeah. Now, let's have a little look at Stephen Hales. Let's see Hales. if we can look up Stephen Hales. Now, Stephen Hales, I came across Stephen Hales' name uh, a couple of weeks ago. He was a clergyman. Yeah, all these clergymen who turn and have a dab hand at science is unbelievable, isn't it? Oh, but Stephen Hales uh, was an English clergyman who made major, major contributions to a range of scientific fields, including botany, pneumatic chemistry and physiology. He was the first person to measure blood pressure. Mm. He also invented several devices, including a ventilator, a pneumatic trough and a surgical forceps for the removal of bladder stones. In addition to these achievements, he was a philanthropist and wrote a popular tract on alcoholic intemperance. Mm. He, should have, uh, he could have started up Al-Anon, couldn't he? Al Alcoholics Anonymous. Oh, he could have, yeah. But anyway, so we've got plant physiology and the chemistry of air. Now, in veged vegetable statics, statics, Hales studied transpiration, mm. the loss of water from the leaves of plants. He estimated the surface area of the leaves of the plant and the length of the surface area of the roots. This allowed Hales to compare the calculated influx of water into the plant with the amount of water leaving the plant by transpiration through the leaves. He also measured the force of the sap, or root pressure. Hales commented that plants very probably draw through their leaves some part of their nourishment from the air. In vegetable statics, Hales prefigured the cohesion theory of water movement in plants, although his ideas were not understood at the time, so he did not influence the debate on water transport in plants in the 19th century. He also speculated that plants might use light as a source of energy for growth. Based on Isaac Newton's suggestion that gross bodies and light might be incontrovertible. In vegetable statics, Hales also described experiments that showed that air freely enters plants, not only with the principal fund of nourishment by the roots, but also through the surface of their trunks and leaves. There you go. While Hales' work on the chemistry of air appears primitive by modern standards, its importance was acknowledged by Antoine Lavoisier. Aha, uh -huh, that French Where's chemist, chemist yeah. who is the father of chemist, modern, modern day chemistry. chemistry. Mm. The discoverer of oxygen. Well, Hale's invention of the pneumatic trough to collect gases over water is also considered a major technical advance. Modified forms of the pneumatic trough were later used by William Bra Brownrigg, Henry Cavendish, and Joseph Priestley. Priestley. In their research. Now, well, the main part, point here is that he described experiments that showed air freely enters plants. Yeah, but the thing is, is that Hale studied transpiration yeah. in plants. He wasn't um, really that interested in photosynthesis. Because at the time, photosynthesis really hadn't, uh, the idea hadn't really been taken on board at all, had it? No. You know, what century was he in? He was in... Uh, oh, 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 Let's go up to the top when he was born. I'm there. 1677. Yeah, 1677 until 1761. So... 18th, 16th, 18th century. 17th, 18th century. 18th century, yeah. Beats born Kent, he was born. But uh, it gives mm. you an idea that years ago, a lot of people used to have the right understanding on the natural world. The world yeah. They used to have the right understanding, you know, that plants yeah. transpire. They absorb air, which contains moisture. Because yeah. this is something that Stephen Hales obviously overlooked. The plant absorbs air, which is, you know, which contains moisture. moisture. Yeah. Well, and the no plant to us. releases uh, water because of the... Oh, transpiration. Know, transpiration, yeah. yeah. Sweats. I don't, I do, do we need to show the video just to... Of the well, you can farm. do yeah. survival technique. Uh, yeah. Where should we get? Oh, we can go on this one, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, so water from a plant. Just get water, survival water from a from plant. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. you've got this one. How to collect water from plants? Yeah, yeah. we've got you've got uh, this video survival. here. Survival. Survival. Chad Zuba out in the deserts. Chad Zuba. 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 
thirsty. So here's Chad. I think that's Chad there. Yeah, in the hot sun. Oh, it's hot sun, yeah. Breaking down. His, his can's out of water. water. Oh, he's got a few drops there. Water. Evapotranspiration. Mm. So what he does is that... Uh, he's got a carrier bag. Oh, how handy. He's got a carrier bag, and he's put in his little or food bag or something over a plant. He's going to seal it, put in a... I think he's going to put in a nut just to uh, weigh it down. There you go. Seal it up. Okay. And he'll just leave it there for a while, I'm sure. What's he doing now? Putting another bag. Oh, is that another bag? Oh, he's got quite a few bags. Look at this. Okay. He's just been to Tesco and uh, bought a whole pack of them. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, there you go. So he's... Has he got twine as well? He's going to wrap yeah, twine around. Yeah, twine so they don't oh, fall yeah. off. He's uh, making a good job of this, isn't he? A survival, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, he's out in the outback in Australia, isn't he? Yeah. You know? No, so. Yeah, come on. So anyway, many so hours got, later. So many hours later. So he's going to have a little snooze now or probably make himself a fire. Come on. Uh, whatever. Not but, interested. Uh, no, he's going to have a little nap. That's what he's going to do. Sit under the sun, look. So he hasn't got a book to read. Oh, look. There oh, we look. Go. Now, we can see that inside the bag, there's moisture collecting. Yeah. Which shows the plant is sweating yeah. and releasing water. water. Okay. So, and this is uh, our understanding of transpiration. Yeah. So, it, it's actually quite interesting to uh, test the pH and the TDS of that water. Yeah. I mean, uh, it'd be nice to actually drink it and yeah. see what it tastes like, you know. Yeah. Might have a little... Uh, Kind of taste, but you can see our understanding that plants they don't they don't photosynthesize in the absorb CO two from the natural environment and then release oxygen. Not when we look at this, plants simply release moisture mm. in the atmosphere. That's, true. That's yeah. what they release. Mm. They release moisture. You know. Well, this is proof. Absolutely, this, this is, is proof. proof. I mean, you know, where's the oxygen? Yeah. You know. Oh, don't tell me. Yeah, the oxygen's in the water. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> you know, but you know, plants release wa- water vapor at the end of the there we go. Come know, on, that's proof. But uh, anyway, so Stephen Hales, you know, he had it right. Yeah, you know, he had it right when he studied transpiration. Oh, yeah, the loss of water from the leaves of plants. plants yeah. There's a, a dem- quick demonstration of it. You know, there we go. Well done, Stephen. So thank you so much, Stephen. Yeah, well done, that man. Well Lovely, done, superb, well superb. So where, what are we on now then, Peter? Well, our main topic. Are we really? Wow. Yeah, one of our main topics. Look at this. We've been Can going for an hour. Really? We've been going one for One whole hour. Well, there we go. The ancient Chinese drilling for, for natural for gas and oil. And oil. oil. Mm. Oh, dear. Excuse me. Oh, it's my lovely dinner. Oh, anyway, it's still there. Now, we, we, um, because I don't think we, we got into this a isn't conversation, be long, didn't but we? We got into a conversation with a uh, person. No, it's that one there. This one here. Because we tend to watch videos and we tend to leave comments. And, uh, yeah, we, we basically... So, they're talking... In the thread is talking about oil, because obviously the pri- people are talking about the price of oil because the price is going up. Yeah. And if you... Oh, uh, yeah, sorry. Our first comment is was here, and we put... Um, in, in my opinion, crude oil is made from dissolving rock layers with chemicals that are pumped down into the rock layers. The products pumped up to the surface are what people call natural gas and crude oil. Mm. All the time humans produce natural gas and crude oil, the rock layers deep under the ground are simply vanishing. Sure. Saudi Arabia and Russia are two of the world's largest suppliers of oil because hardly nobody lives in the drilling areas where the land could potentially cave in. Yeah. Sinkholes are often associated with fracking, which is a very similar process. The oil companies only say oil comes from fossils to hide what really happens under the ground. Sure. And it's amazing. You leave that comment. A lot of people didn't like that. Absolutely, yeah, they didn't like Oof. it. But uh, Kim Witt. Kim Witt. Mm. Uh, she, she says the Netherlands have found out what gas mining in a populated area can mean. Look up Groningen. Groningen. Uh, gas, gas earthquakes. earthquakes. Billions of damage. damage. Mm. And we wrote uh, to we wrote, her. Yes, it's to be expected. That's why they mainly draw up gas and oil from non-populated areas. Absolutely, yeah, that's our view. Uh, we don't then that Gerdu is talking about, oh, you, you, you're talking rubbish. Yeah, we don't need to There's talk about... F- a formal fallacy of logic goes into all that fallacy. Sure, rubbish. but Kim Wick replied, sorry, but you need to go back to school on this. 
because she's thinking, but what, what you talk, you're talking rubbish. Mm. There's, so we, there's fossil fuels. Yeah. So, and how is school going to prove to me that gas and oil are naturally occurring materials deep, deep underground? underground? Yeah. How? How is a chemistry or geography teacher going, going to, to do, do that? that? Tell, Tell me, me please, please, Kim. Kim. Please. I mean, right, yeah, so are you suggesting that a mixture of acids, water, sand and high pressure won't dissolve certain rocks? rocks? Yeah. Are you suggesting metals don't originate from rocks and an acid metal reaction won't produce hydrogen? Yeah, because if you think about it logically, uh, a lot of metals come from rocks, okay? Yeah. Yeah? And when you uh, mix your acid with a metal, uh, you'll get a reaction which will release hydrogen. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, essentially one could argue that hydrogen has come from the rock. Yeah. 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 And another thing to think about as well, which is what I'm thinking about, and isn't it strange how in man's world, or possibly in the natural world as well, there's only one thing that burns. And I could go back into time and call that phlogiston. Phl- yeah, absolutely. Phl- it's the only thing that burns. Or so it's the impurities contained within a hydrogen pressure, pressure system. Yeah. But it's the only thing. Water doesn't burn. Absolutely, yeah, sure. Absolutely, Lots yeah. of things don't burn, but things that do burn contain hydrogen. Burn in the sense that it produces a flame. flame. Yeah. Contain hydrogen and release impurities when they are decomposed. Right. Through, through combustion. Or through, yeah, basically, yeah. So anyway, so Kim Witt, uh, where is she now? She, she's disappeared here. Oh, here she is. Um, yeah. she's, but YouTube is picky about allowing links. So an earlier reply was refused. Without any links, I can tell you right here that natural gas and oil was found and used even in ancient times. You can Google this quite easily. Back then, they didn't have the tech to drill deep, let alone inject anything deep into the ground. They sure as hell couldn't make any hydrocarbons. I suppose you think coal is also a man-made product. Even That's a nonsensical thing to say, isn't it? Knowing that there are coal mines and you can go down and dig up a piece of coal. Coal, But anyway, uh, you really need to get an education in geology and chemistry to find out how things actually happen. This is You're sounding bit. like a flat earther. Bum, bum, bum. There we go. Now scroll down. So we Here reply we to a well, no. Kim Wick quote, natural Kim gas. And Where do you get your information from? Walt Disney. Or well, don't tell me a history book. Your statement cannot be verified. Sure. In that she's saying that natural oil and gas was found and used even in ancient Times. Times. Oh, it, of course. And she, she writes, I would post the links, but YouTube won't let me. Try Googling it yourself uh, with the words ancient plus petroleum or ancient gas China. Or don't if you're afraid of learning something. So, okay. Yeah. okay, so if you've all, already absorbed the info, what proof is there? Because you want to hear it from this person. You don't want to go off on a tangent. Well, you don't want to waste your time Sorry. going to research something yeah. that's just going to come yeah. to no avail. Let's hear it from the horse's mouth. What proof is there ancient civilizations used crude oil, petroleum, and natural gas? Yeah, it's all right. Yeah, because this is the thing. It's all right saying that ancient civilizations were mining for crude oil, uh, natural gas, or even using a Baghdad battery. battery. Yeah, I know. But yeah, yeah. What, what would they use them for? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Where's what, the technology? Where's that's the been technology dug up? that would be needed in order to use it? Use it. It's like crude oil. You need to refine it. You can't just burn it because it doesn't burn crude oil. I'm sure it doesn't. If you put a light to it, it doesn't burn. Oh, um, I'm not sure actually. I don't. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure, it sure you're right. Yeah, because it relies on the evaporation. It relies on the eva- the thinning out of it yeah. and the evaporation. Yeah. Um, sure, because the medium that it's in is um, water, water yeah. vapor. Yeah, absolutely, of course. But uh, blah blah blah. Um, okay, so, so if go. you've already absorbed the info, what proof is yeah. there? Blah 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 blah. I've just read an article on the C- CSE rec- G record about ancient Chinese drilling. Okay. And there's, oh, no, no yeah. I was going to just go on to no, that. I've just read an article on CSE G record about ancient drilling, ancient Chinese drilling, and there's no information about drilling for gas. Yeah. And here's the. Oh, wait oh, there. Oh, this, this one, one here. Yeah. This is go. ancient Chinese drilling. 
Um, some uh, we don't need to go on it. Uh, which do we need to go on later? Um, through a little research, I discovered the existence of a museum dedicated to Sichuan's ancient brine salt, salt. gas industry. Okay. Mm. Oh, we got gas industry there. The Salt Museum, it is located in Zigong City, named after two of its mo uh, famous salt wells, about three hours drive south of the, of the provincial capital, Chengdu. Chengdu. I resigned myself to the fact that it was highly unlikely I'd be close to China in the near future, let alone Zigong. Then earlier this year, out of the blue, a business-related trip to Chengdu materialised and I was determined to visit the Salt Museum while over there. It all worked out, and this article is the result. My aim is to provide interested readers with an understanding of the fascinating achievements of these people hundreds of years ago. As with my previous article, this is not a scholarly analysis, but rather an amateur's efforts to share his enthusiasm and provide entertaining and stimulating reading. Mm. Now, so obviously it's a, a ancient brine, brine salt solution, okay, and gas industry, okay, that's what we're told. So let's have a little look through. Right, okay. And uh, there we go. Um, just trying to think, where do we pick up? No, just keep, just scroll through. Let's just scroll through, okay. The There's the salt, salt museum, museum, a street view of the salt museum, not a gas, but salt museum. Oil, oil. It's not an oil museum. Uh, so built, built, built in the mid 1700s. No different um, to the Salt Museum in Northwich. Absolutely, of course, yeah. Oh, 7,000 uh, years ago. Oh, here we go. The earliest evidence of wells in China in the Zhejiang province comes from the era when humans were first turning to agriculture in this region, some 7,000 years ago. Approxima approximately 5,000 years ago, Chinese coastal people were boiling seawater to produce salt. salt. Well, that's quite easy to do. You only want a fire, don't you? And, and a pot. And evaporate um, the water. And evaporate the water and you're left with the salt. Mm. Absolutely, of course. Uh, as high-density human settlement penetrated further and further inland and increasingly relied on farming, salt critical to human survival as a vital food supplement and preservative became a valuable commodity. Yeah, because they would have used salt as a preservative for meats. For meats, absolutely. Salt was used even before the refrigerator came into existence. Mm. And they were using salt to preserve foods, meats, anyway, etc. But uh, the first recorded salt well in China was dug in Sichuan province around 2,250 years ago. This was the first time water well technology was applied successfully to the exploitation of salt and marked the beginning of Sichuan's salt drilling industry. industry. Yeah, but so what they did was that they drilled a hole and then put water down there yeah. to dissolve, dissolve the, the salt, salt and then they brought it up as brine. Brought it up as brine, yeah, of course. And there's a picture there of uh, a modern rec recreation of drilling technique from the North Song dynasty. Uh, there you go. So there we go. Uh, there's a little picture of the different uh, different tools that they used to use. Absolutely, of course. Uh, there's a mo working model. Uh, there we go, and all this lot. Uh, talking about cave-ins there, talking about the different bits and stuff. There's a fish a fishtail drill bit there that was used. Thousand meters. There you go. Look. Oh, here by, you the, go. by the 1700s, Sichuan wells were typically in the range of three to four hundred meters deep. Yeah, and in 1835, the Shanghai well was the first well in the world to exceed a thousand meters of depth. Absolutely, of course, but they're only bringing up salt. Yeah, there's no Brian. mention here at all about gas. Well, and it says there, uh, jam with salt. Um, the Sichuan salt producing industry, salt producing industry, was centered around Zigong, and early photographs show hundreds of producing derricks. Salt stove operations in the Fuxi River jammed with salt, so only salt, salt trading boats. Brine and natural gas were transported through hundreds of kilometres of bamboo pipeline. Well, where does the natural gas where come from? Where does the from? natural gas come from? Yeah, all, all that's bullshit. They're only going down three, four hundred metres. Are they? No, they've got one thousand metres there. Thousand metres. But the thing is, yeah, sorry, in 1835. The, the point is, where does the natural gas, gas come, come from? from? 
Yeah. Uh, any ideas? You know, what would they use it for? Where's, where's, what would they Absolutely. use it for? Yeah, but all of these. For the gas stoves. Absolutely. Yeah. This is, um, they're talking about gas wells here. Look, a photo of Zigong early in the 20th century showing many of the derricks used to drill and produce brine, brine and gas wells. But we're, we're talking 2000 years ago, yeah. ancient Chinese drilling yeah. for natural gas. This is 20th century. This There's is nothing in this article about um, gas drilling in ancient yeah. Chinese times, ancient times. If you look None up, whatsoever. If you go up that, well, around 2,000 years ago, Chinese in Sichuan province originated deep drilling. Yeah. The primary motive for deep drilling was the search for salt. salt. It wasn't for gas. Gas or That's why, that's why it's all, it's all a load of rubbish. All these people telling you that uh, these wells were, were built to drill for uh, salt and gas. It's just total rubbish. They were only there for salt mm. originally. I mean, it could be that twenty in the twentieth century they could have been pumping down there for natural uh, for, to, to frack, frack, yeah, and actually yeah. dissolve the um, rock layers, right. yeah, possibly. for fuel mm. to bring up crude oil and natural gas. It is possible, but uh, when we're talking about or, ancient times, or it's possible that they had to pour in some acids at certain points to dissolve the rock rock layer so that they could get to the salt layer. Uh, absolutely, yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, who if knows? If they pumped down acids, it would produce the gas. Yeah, I mean, who knows? But at the end of the day, then there's no natural gas under the ground. Well, in our opinion. Under the, the, under the ground surface. Yeah, in our surface opinion. Yeah, in our opinion, yeah. So anyway, get back on a comment. So let's get back on our comment, which was uh, that one here. Yeah. So um, she, yeah, she wrote, says, read more. Oh, yeah. sorry, yeah. yeah. The, uh, I've just read the article about ancient challenges, and there's no information about drilling for gas. There's only info about drilling for salt, which I completely understand. Yeah. Think about it logically. If they had brought up natural gas, there's no evidence of it on, on that, that page. page. None, None whatsoever. whatsoever. Yeah, another fantasy story to corroborate another bullshit story regarding natural gas and crude oil. Yeah, so Kim Witt replies, I will allow myself to stoop down to your apparent level of development. Have you ever watched Aladdin with the magic lamp? That is an oil lamp. Just look it up, you willfully ignorant asshole. Piece of shit. Piece of crap. Poo-poo. There we go. So we just leave a one comment. So we leave a one comment here. Aladdin's lamp. If you rubbed it three times, will a genie appear? Ah, yeah. So you're answering a fantasy story with another fantasy story. Taken from Wikipedia entry on oil lamps. Yeah. Sources of fuel for oil lamps include a wide variety of plants such as nuts, walnuts, almonds and cuckoo, cookie, and seeds, sesame, olive, castor or flax. Also widely used were animal fats. Butter, ghee, fish oil, shark liver, whale blubber, or seal. Yeah. Camphene, a blend of turpentine and ethanol, was the first burning fluid fuel for lamps after whale oil supplies were depleted. Yeah. Nowhere does it state that oil from under the ground was burned in ancient oil lamps. Yeah, I know, yeah. Your reply demonstrates how little you really know. Unsurprising when you watch too much Disney. Sure. But she, she replied, actually. Um, oh, so you can Google, but not... Oh, oh, so you can Google that, but not, not the rest. rest. How selective. selective. Go away and be stupid, stupid somewhere else. else. And yet, the, you know, she, she's... But, and then we write, you're the one who's claiming the ancient Chinese extracted natural gas and oil from deep under the ground, making people think gas and oil occur naturally. But you're not providing any evidence. Yeah. Come on, Kim, you've been educated, or is it indoctrinated? With a question mark. So you should be able to provide some evidence for your claim or you should retract it. You know, and then she just basically just takes the piss now, doesn't she? Your willful ignorance is astounding and beyond the comprehension of those of us who have a functional brain. Yeah. She's actually saying that she has a functional Your brain, brain. Yeah, even know, though yeah. she's saying something that she knows she hasn't got any proof whatsoever. She can't corroborate yeah. her, her, her statement. Yeah. And yet we commented without any links, where well, we quoted her, without any links, I can tell you right here that natural gas and oil was found and used even ancient times. Yeah, yet you're the one who can't prove that, that statement. statement. Yeah. She can't prove it at all. At all. Yeah. So many people just live in this dream, dream world. world, it's yeah. just unbelievable. 
they they they're indoctrinated with the information from from education because they like to think they like to think that they've been they've been digging for they've been drilling for oil and gas for centuries in other words it's plentiful yeah but the the the, the reality is it's a load of rubbish they in haven't been opinion. drilling for natural gas and oil in ancient times Drums, yeah i mean if you if you think we're wrong and you've got some information out there We'd love to see it. We'd love yeah. to see how these ancient people were actually drilling for natural gas and oil when we know, or when it's our understanding, that um, f- to produce natural gas and crude oil, you need to you, you need to basically pump down into the ground modern day chemicals, mm. chemicals, chemicals, chemicals that were manufactured in the eighteenth century, nineteenth century, hydrofluoric acid. acid. Hydrochloric acid, acid. Mm. probably sulfuric acid, and everybody lots should, of shit, and everybody some should sand know. and some high pressure, and everybody should know that when you when you ex- uh, introduce an acid to certain rocks, they will dissolve and release a gas. Absolutely, of course, especially under high pressure. Yes, you know, uh, and if you've got sand to abrade the rock layer as well. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Because you get you get this like because it's pumped in high pressure, you've got a swirling mass. It's like yeah. it's like basically um, sandpaper, abrasive paper, rubbing against you, against you know, yeah, against yeah. the rock surface. Yeah, and it's just going to dissolve it, isn't it? Yeah, that, yeah. you know, that's exactly what we see or what how we understand what's happening deep underground, and when you, they're pumping all of these fracking fluids and stuff. Yeah. Down there, and you've got to remember that hydrofluoric acid dissolves um, silica. Yeah, it will dissolve glass, sand. Absolutely. You know. So if you're pumping sand down there, so the sand will um, abrade the, the the sides of the, the walls of the yeah, the, but eventually wall, dissolve. But will eventually dissolve. Absolutely. And of we know that silica silicas silicates contain lots of oxygen. Absolutely. Of course. Yeah. So you know. Heat, but there oxygen. you go. Yeah, I mean, if you've got any proof out there that ancient ancient civilizations were like the Egyptians, maybe the ancient Greeks, yeah, maybe the Babylonians, yeah, maybe maybe yeah. The, they were all drilling for natural gas and oil. But we've got to remember they, they were the precursors of BP. Oh, uh, but we've got to remember that man discovered hydrogen in seventeen sixty six, seventeen sixties, something like that. Cavendish, yeah. Cavendish, Henry Cavendish. And not long after then, it wouldn't have taken long for someone to work out. Oh, sorry. If they'd have found natural gas and oil many in the ancient times, they would have found hydrogen a lot earlier. Yeah, yeah well, there a was lot that. earlier. But Cavendish discovered hydrogen. It wouldn't have taken someone a lot long after that to have put two and two together and thought, if you put an acid onto a metal, it will release hydrogen. Metals are made from rocks. minerals, or ores, ores. So if you put the acid on the ore, it will release under high pressure. It will release the hydrogen. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, of course, yeah. And uh, because yeah. you've got to think that the more you drill down, the the more pressure that the rocks are under. I would, yeah, sure. Which means the greater amount of hydrogen you can you can obtain, you can extract Back. from the rock the rock layer. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Absolutely, of course. So uh, you know, there we go. We've done it. So, so there we have it. But uh, you know, I mean, for for a lot of people to think the ancient Chinese or any ancient civilizations were that clever, I mean, especially drilling for natural gas and oil. I mean, you 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 got in my in our opinion, you you got to have your head tested. A screw loose. You got bolt. S- bolt you got bolt, bolt loose. Absolutely, of course. Yeah. But uh, yeah, anyway. it just goes to show a lot of people want, want to live in their dream world. No, they don't want to live in the real world. They don't want to live in the real world. They want to live in their dream world. Mm. Yeah, absolutely, of course, yes. Yeah. Uh, but it's all rubbish. So mm. there you have it for another episode. So, Isn't that lovely, of course? So thanks ever so much. And always remember till next time, if something doesn't make sense, like ever thinking the ancient Chinese drilled for natural gas and, and oil. crude oil. oil. Yeah. Of thinking that the Earth has this magnetosphere and it's just like a bar magnet. The f- magnetic field lines are like a bar magnet. Yeah, sure. Or if you ever thought that Aristotelian uh, understandings or viewpoints concerning uh, a falling apple were wrong when they haven't been pr- disproved at all, uh, yeah, mm. of course, yeah. yeah. If you think uh, air contains 21% oxygen, 
Absolutely, or water's H2O, or mm. uh, uh, plants absorb CO2 mm. and release mm. oxygen. Mm. Absolutely, of course, yes. Yeah. It's, all, it's all bollocks, isn't it, of course. Okay. So thanks ever so much, and we'll see you next, next time. time. Okay. Bye. ta -da. The Earth isn't round, it's flat. How do you know? I've observed it in all my travels over Europe. It's flat, everywhere it's flat.